Welcome to painting winter greenery. In this video, I'm going to show you how to paint a pine branch, a little forest in the winter, a pine cone, a juniper branch with some juniper berries, and a pine tree using a fan brush. Be sure to check out the links below for other video tutorials that might be perfect for your holiday season. Let's begin. We're not working with very complicated colors here. We're keeping it super simple using Hooker's Green Dark or Sap Green as a base and just adding super simple combinations of colors to these greens to make them look more natural. I'm using Raw Sienna, Burnt Umber, Violet, Ultramarine Blue, and Prussian Blue. We're not even making custom colors in the palette. In fact, we're gonna be mixing right on the surface. So stay tuned and learn how to make all of these with four brushes and a handful of colors. I'll be using a dropper to drop in color to change the depth and saturation levels of the pools of paint. I love having a test strip, preferably the same kind of paper that you're gonna be painting on. I'm using Artist Quality Arches paper and it is 100% rag or cotton paper. If you're using a student grade paper, you might have slightly different results as the paint tends to sit on top, but for this exercise, you should be just fine. I'm gonna use a handful of brushes. Make sure you're using a round brush that has a nice big belly and comes to a fine point. That's the kind of brush that you need for some of this one stroke painting. I'm using my number 10 designer blend, but an eight or a 10 will work perfectly fine. I wanna show you how to make some texture using a fan brush. I'm using my ivory fling, and it's a little one inch synthetic brush. The bristles stay perfectly splays, which is what you're really gonna want for this technique. And you can use a liner or a rigger. And then um, if you don't have a liner or a rigger with these long bristles, you can use a number one or even a number two pointed round brush. You wanna make sure that you've got some paper towel or a rag, something for blotting your paint. Of course, a jar of water. And then I also like to have on hand a little bit of tissue for blotting. Before I get started, I like to wet my paint. If you're using paints that come in a tube, you wanna have them all squeezed out in your palette. If they dry up, that's totally fine because you can just reactivate them with water. You can do that with a spray bottle, or in this case, I'm just dropping a little bit of water into the paints. Now you only need to let that water in your palette sit for a couple of minutes before it's primed and has gotten to that point of being kind of tacky. And I do recommend using a stiffer synthetic brush. Again, um, I'm just using a brush for my line of brushes, but any stiff synthetic brush will do. Synthetic bristles hold less paint, so there's less waste in your jar of water. And because they are a little bit more rigid, you can scoop up a pretty good amount of paint. I'm gonna wet my brush. So I'm using the Hooker's Green Dark. And I always add the paint and then add water to it. I prefer making more saturated pools and then diluting if I need to. If you start with water, you'll end up likely having very diluted and watery results. So start with your paint and then add water to it. Now, if you don't wanna waste your paint just yet, you can add a couple of drops of water with your dropper. So Hooker's Green Dark on its own is pretty bright and it can look a little phony. So I wanna have on hand a couple of choices to change that color, and you can change it in your palette and create a completely new customized color, or you can change the color by dropping in a new color into the wet green right on the surface of your paper. And that's the way we're going to be painting today. So I'm gonna just have this value of Hooker's Green Dark available in my palette. Rinse my brush. And I'm going to uh, then put out some Prussian blue. I'm just going to skip a space so that they don't accidentally contaminate each other. So here's my Prussian blue and it's pretty bright. It's a, a very cool blue. 
and then I'm going to pull out some ultramarine blue and it's a little redder in color and I'll show you right here what that looks like so you can see compared to the Prussian blue that it is a um, much more vibrant and cheerful result what I also want to do is have a little bit of violet on hand so I'm going to put that out in my palette So this is the hue of that particular violet that I'm using. And I'm going to also put out some burnt umber so it's like a nice dark chocolatey brown. And you can see I'm giving myself pretty generous pools here so that I don't run out of color. And this is what this brown looks like. And then finally, I'm going to have a little bit of raw sienna. Beautiful kind of golden wheat color. So that other green I was talking about earlier is the sap green. And I'm just going to leave a little space in this palette so that I don't mix up the greens for you. And that it's clear as to which green I'll be drawing from. So here's the sap green. So you can see the sap green and the first green dark have very different qualities. The sap green is much warmer, much earthier looking on its own, and it's quite natural. Whereas the hooker's green dark is more like um, a pine green, but an unnatural version of pine green. So this combination will take us quite far as you'll see. So I'm gonna rinse my brush wipe this brush and we're done with this mixing brush so I can just put it aside. So for this tutorial I'm going to be sketching with an H pencil. I want to make sure it's nice and sharp. For any reference material check out my links in the description below and you can download some of my sketching templates to make things a little bit easier if you're not comfortable with doing this freehand. So the first thing I'm going to do is demonstrate a nice little grouping of trees that I'm going to be painting with my round brush. So I'm going to position them about here and they're going to be no bigger than the palm of my hand. So I'm going to just start with a simple horizon line, about four inches long here. So it's just a light line to give me some sort of sense of a base for where my tree line is going to come from. And just using a really natural stroke, I'm going to create a variety of heights for these trees. And I want to make sure that my lines look quite natural and that the contour itself is looking quite natural. If my sketch is natural and loose looking, then my painting will be natural and loose looking. If I create something that's too confined and contrived looking, then of course it goes to say that my paint is going to look rather controlled as well. I want to leave myself some flexibility in changing um, shapes and being spontaneous and in the moment when the time comes to actually paint these trees. As I move back into the background, I want to have slightly finer, smaller, and lighter trees. That's big enough. So for this example, be sure to consult my video on how to set up your watercolor space to make it really efficient for you to move fluidly and easily here in your configuration. I'm going to be starting with my I'm going to be starting with my number 10 and again it seems like a really big brush for the space but because it comes to such a fine point I'll be able to maneuver into these small spaces. If at any point it becomes too cumbersome, I can just easily switch over to my number one. So I have my brushes handy. Typically cool colors recede and warm colors come forward. So what I want to do is make sure that my background trees are the lightest 
and the thinnest in application and they're going to be a little cooler so in order to achieve a cool color I'll be introducing some bluer tones. Now this is quite a small space, you don't need to pre-wet, but if you want to or if you're a bit more cautious, I'll show you how it looks when we pre-wet the space. So I'm going to pre-wet this entire shape and this just allows the paint to really move effortlessly over the surface and it will buy you a little bit more time as you fill up the shape with color. The paint tends to just sort of sit as a um, skin on top of the paper floats on the water. Whereas if you don't pre-wet it, it will stain into the paper right away. So what I wanna do is use my Hooker's Green Dark, just verify it on my test strip here, and I'm just gonna float that onto the surface. And that's quite green right now and quite artificial looking. So what I wanna do before that dries up is just switch quickly over to my small number one. I'm gonna go into the Prussian blue and I'm just going to water it down and I'm gonna drop that into the tips of those background trees. And I'm working fairly quickly here. I've painted the core first and now I'm just dragging out these fine little strokes to indicate tiny little brushes. To indicate tiny little branches. And now I'm sort of painting wet into wet because the surface of the painting was wet and the paint that I lay down first is still quite wet. So I'm actually just grabbing from my test strip here and I continue just dropping that in. That's the Prussian blue. Now, this seems a little vibrant to me, so I'm going to grab a little bit of the violet. And what the violet will do is because it has red in it, it's going to dull down this tree line significantly. So I like the look of the purple and the blue and the green mixing together, but I also like the look of it just being fresh and really visible. So I'm not gonna mix it up too, too much. You can even have a few little bare trees if you want to that just have branches. Nothing too complicated. Try not to play in there too long or you might end up with blooms. That's when too much water is introduced to a surface that's starting to dry up and it creates this big gaping hole. Now, before all of that dries, I want to take just some tissue and I'm going to blot to lighten this all up because I want to create a little bit of a ghost effect for those trees and that helps to push them into the distance even more. So you can let this dry or you can use a hair dryer and actually speed up the drying time. So this is quite pale and that's exactly what I want. I want to be able to build and add layers here. So I'm going to do the same thing with an ever so slightly heavier application. So we won't be blotting this time. So I'm going to use the Hooker Screen Dark once again. You may find it easier just to start with some lines and then build the trees around that. Make sure that they're not too evenly planted as I've just done here. Make sure that they're staggered in a natural way. Now I'm working fairly quickly here because I did not pre-wet my surface, but if you want a little bit more time and flexibility, you certainly could pre-wet your surface, but you'd have to be careful to stay really well within your shapes. So now I've just dipped my brush into the Hooker's Green Dark again, and I'm applying slightly crisper and more refined branches than the first time. Still just using the Hooker's Green Dark. Before that dries, I just want to add a little bit of violet and create a bit more depth in here. And the depth and the dimension comes from just playing with 
slightly darker and warmer colors or slightly lighter and cooler colors. So I'm flip-flopping between the hooker screen dark, violet, and I've introduced some burnt umber that will really warm things up. So you can see I'm just sort of dabbing the color and I can do that because the paper surface is still wet, but the minute it starts to dry up, I should probably quit or I'm gonna run into trouble with an inconsistency of what's staying dry and what is still wet. So just pulling the little branches out from the existing shapes that I've given myself here. And we'll just keep the bottom rather abstract because we're going to finish this off with a final layer of the darkest trees. Now we can make some of these a little taller. They don't all have to be uh, the same height. And if it's a natural forest, you should have variation in the heights. So I always look for signs of drying and I do see spots that are starting to dry up. So that's a good sign for me to stop. So I'm just going to dry this up So the final layer of color will be much warmer. That will help to bring the trees a little bit closer. And I'm also going to start bringing some trunks down into our snow to complete our winter feel and the winter scene here. So I'm going to use the hooker screen dark just as a base. This time I'm gonna come down with a variety of lengths of tree trunks. Now I'm just going to do a few at a time and I wanna make sure that they're interspersed naturally. And before those dries, I will start painting the trees. I'm going to use my sap green because it is a little bit warmer. Now these lower branches are heavier, so they're going to point downward. You can see that the paint is pretty fluid here. And once again, just working fairly quickly. And the smaller branches can point upwards, but I'm going to um, apply those with my smaller brush. So just using the sap green, working quickly. And these trees should be a little larger. So in fact, I'm gonna give them a little bit more space. You can even use the belly of the brush to just build up bulkier areas to the core of the tree. Now I'm gonna to switch to my little brush and I'm gonna add a little bit of burnt umber and I'm going to start creeping up a little bit higher. And the smaller branches can point upward because they're lighter and freer. So I'm trying as much as possible to pull my strokes outward from the core. When I get kind of to the middle of the tree, I can start pointing downward. Before those dry, I'd like to just drop a little bit of violet into some of the trees that maybe just giving them the feeling that they're tucked farther behind and that they have a little bit of shadow. So upward and outward, you never want your branches to be evenly spaced and you don't want them even in length either. So I'm flip-flopping between using the sap green, the violet, sometimes the hooker's green dark if you want, and for sure using some of that burnt umber. I have to say, when I work quickly, I feel a little bit stressed, <laughs> but the upside of that is that you learn to be a little bit more efficient about your strokes and you can create certainly more spontaneous results as well. I find the slower I go, the more cautious I am. So if you're trying to make this more whimsical looking and freer and just lighter, 
um, try setting a timer for yourself and being a little um, more compressed, trying to find out what kind of shortcuts can you take as you speed through the process. Obviously, if you're new, new, new to this, then maybe take your time. I can lengthen the tree trunks if I want to just um, exaggerate some of them, bring them forward a little bit more. You can even have some trees that barely have any needles on them, so they're mostly just woodsy branches. Using the burnt umber here. Just getting a few bare branches. That's kind of what happens with pine trees is they tend to be a little more sparse in the lower portion. Now you could leave it just like this, or if you wanted to, you could put a little bit of ultramarine to indicate that there's a snowy shadow. If you're going to do that, you have to dry this up first. I'm going to show you what would happen if we put a little bit of a shadow color underneath. Shadows don't have to be complicated, and I would never ever use a gray or a black. Instead, I highly recommend for snow using something like an ultramarine. Now we're gonna keep this really simple. I'm working on dry and then I'm going to be bleeding out the edge. If I pre-wet this, I do risk activating the paint that I put down. So I'm going to work quickly on dry, just using my ultramarine as a nice little shadow color. And you can see I did activate some of that burnt umber. It's okay to have a little bit of bleeding because you always do have a bit of um, environmental color influencing some of the final shadow tones. So that burnt umber was still a little bit damp. So let this be a warning to you. Let's put this on a little bit of a hill. So I'm going to just create a bit of a curve to this snow. And I don't even mind having a little bit of a rough texture underneath that will kind of give a crispier snow. You can even blot if you want to control where your shadow is or if it's bleeding beyond where you'd like it to be. And then finally, I'm just going to take a little bit of violet and add that to deepen the shadows farther into the forest. And we've created a really delightful winter forest. So using those same colors, I'm going to now create a little pine branch and it's going to have a mixture of color. This is gonna happen quite quickly. So for this one, I'd recommend either using a small number one or two pointed round brush like this, or in this case, I'm going to be using my um, rigger. So it just has a long bristle and keeps me from having to re-dip into my pools of paint. It's a lot more efficient to work with. In this illustration, you're welcome to pre-draw the branch if you want to, or like myself, I'm just gonna wing it here. I'm gonna use a little bit of burnt umber on my brush and I just soak it all up into the length of the liner. I double check to see what's on my brush, how much of the paint I'm holding. That's just about the right amount. And I wanna make sure that this is dry because if you wanna rest your hand, um, that would be helpful. I like using my baby finger as kind of like a tripod and I'm just gonna paint this branch here and then paint another branch here. Now, before this dries, I wanna take the Hooker's Green Dark, really load up my um, bristles, and just start putting a few little needles on. I only wanna do a few at a time, and I actually really like the look of the brown bleeding into the green, so um, if that happens to you, that's a good thing. Start off with a light touch, because you can always go heavier later. Now, before those greens dry, I wanna drop a little bit of violet in, just to the base where they grow out from the branch. And you can certainly add a little bit of Prussian as well. It just depends on how bright you want this to be. But be playful here, change the length of stroke, change the intensity or the value of the paint, change the color of the paint so that not all the needles are the same color. For the most part, you want the needles all pointing in a similar direction, 
but you can have a little bit of crisscrossing. If you want these to look fluffy, you can paint more on, but if you want it to look more prickly and more like needles, then try to resist the temptation of putting too many on. So all I'm doing here once again is just dropping in some of the violet. It creates a beautiful connection between the branch and the needles themselves. So I'm just dropping in a little bit of that Prussian. Once again, back to this branch now. Starting off lightly with the Hooker's Green Dark. If you're having a hard time with the variety of value range, you can always blot and that quickly lightens things up, kind of like what we did to our trees earlier on. But keep in mind that also dries it up. So if you're hoping to have the new colors bleed, you can see they're quite static and they don't bleed the same way because you dry them up. So it all depends on the look that you're going for. Back to the hooker's green dark. And if you want to add a little bit more depth to the needles, you can go back once they're dry and actually put some shadow on. In this case, because the blotting dried up the paint significantly, they're already um, quite stiff and dry and I can paint over top with no problem. If you want a really natural look, you can drop in some earth tones like the burnt umber. But I kind of like the look of the um, violet. I think that that redness to the violet speaks beautifully to the brown that you're using without actually having to use brown. Now, branches aren't perfect. They usually have little knobbies in them, so you can go back in and add little nodes of burnt umber. This will create a slightly more realistic look to your branch, and it should be just ever so slightly thicker at the base as well. You can play with the length of the uh, needles. You can make this much longer if you want to, or much more sparse. It all depends on the look that you're going for. I will lengthen some of these so that you get a bit of an idea of what that could be like. Just dropping in some of that burnt umber. Make it a, look, a little more natural. That's it, we've got our first pine branch and that was all done with a single brush. This is my ivory rigger. We'll next move on to a nice little juniper branch that has some sweet little juniper berries. I'm gonna start with my raw sienna and I'm going to Create a branch just like our former branch here. And this one's going to be a little bit more rigid. So I'm just going to start with my guide here. And then I'm going to add a few little forks that just come out. And then very quickly, I'm going to use my sap green. So just dipping into my sap green, everything's still really nice and watery. If I want to, I can add water with my brush or add it with my dropper, but in this case, it's still pretty watery. So I'm gonna add a few little strokes. And this one is going to be a little bit different in terms of the style of stroke. So it'll be a little bit more spiky looking, less soft, a little bit more rigid. And playing with the value either by blotting or just varying the uh, amount of paint that you have on your brush or going back a second time and deepening it if you're not able to get it in the first strokes. Now, if you want your brush to taper and be a little less blunt at the end, you can vary the pressure. The harder you press, the fatter the line, the lighter the pressure, the finer the line. 
move quickly here. So you can see how wonderful the rigger is. It just really holds on to the paint. So I can get quite a lot done without having to redip or reload. I think I'm going to add a little bit of Hoker's Green Dark to some of these branches that I know are still active, just to give a bit more depth and dimension. So you can see how that gives a bit more volume and depth. Back to my sap green. Always using your brush stroke from the base up and from against the branch outward. Let's do a few cute little branches that just come from the core. Okay, so finally what I wanna do is um, I think I'll add a little bit of burnt umber to some of these wet spikes here. And I can let that dry or I can just jump right in and add a few little juniper berries to it. But I think without risking having the blue bleed into the needles, I think it's best to dry it up first. Let's take a closer look at how I paint the berries on the juniper branch. I'm gonna be using Prussian blue. So I'm gonna show you a larger format so you can see up close. The juniper berries are kind of like um, a seed shape. They're kind of oblong. So I can fill in the entire shape. And if I want to give it a little bit more dimension, I could add a tiny bit of burnt umber and give it a few seconds and then drop some water into it to create a highlight. By dropping a tiny little bit of water into it, we're essentially creating a bloom. So the pigment that's currently on the paper will open up nicely for us. So right now it kind of looks a bit on the dark side, but I have to give it a few seconds to sink in. And now I, with just clean water, I'm gonna drop a little bit on there and I can even lift up the area that I've kind of cleared out. And I can continue just adding little drops of water until it is the value or uh, has the effect that I want. Another really quick way of getting the same kind of look, just depending on um, the size and how fussy you wanna be with these, is painting that little berry first and just taking some twisted Kleenex and blotting out the highlight. There you go. I'd also like to show you how to paint a pine cone. So we're gonna put that right here. And this is going to be fairly fast. I wanna have some tissue on standby. I'm gonna be painting on dry, and I'm gonna be starting with my raw sienna. So the first thing I wanna do is just give myself an overall shape Again, if you need a little bit of extra help, just consult the description below and you can download any of these templates to make your drawing a little bit easier. So I'm just using some watery raw sienna and I'm just using the natural shape of my brush. So because it comes to a point, pointing my strokes outward. I don't want this to be too even. So just make sure that they're at different widths and distances. And these are a little on the rounded side, so just wanna round those off a little bit more. So what I wanna do before this dries is we're gonna actually add a little bit more dimension to this and have a bit of shadow on the right-hand side. So what I wanna do is take some twisted Kleenex and just blot out some of the highlights. So this guy dried up quite quickly, but I'll be able to show you how I would re-wet this. Just go into that exact shape with just a little bit of water. It hasn't been sitting there that long, so it wouldn't be very difficult to lift. So there we are. So just with some twisted Kleenex here, I'm just gonna blot out a few extra little highlights. 
and I will let that dry. So I'm just going to enhance some of the shape here by increasing the contrast ever so slightly. I'm going to use burnt umber, but you could use even a burnt sienna if you like. And I'm just going to be using sort of a scooping sort of stroke, scooping and dabbing using the tip of my brush. I'm gonna go around some of those highlights that I blotted out. And again, this is my burnt umber. Because the shadow is going to be on the right hand side, I can actually just block in some of this whole right hand side. And I'm going to add a little bit of violet as well. Violet's such a great color for shadow. It just reads so beautifully as a shadow color. So before that dries, I'm just going to blot with very little pressure this time just to lighten up a titch on that left hand side and once again we'll let this dry. Now I'm going to work on dry with my smaller round brush and I'm just going to use my burnt umber. You could actually leave the pine cone just like this if you wanted to but I'm going to just increase the contrast ever so slightly and I'm kind of outlining per se some of the segments in the pine cone. You don't have to do a lot here but just painting the negative spaces so the spaces between the little cupped spade shapes here and before that dries just dropping a little bit of violet in maybe even just watering this out so that the shadows have a feeling of fading out. So just taking a bit of water on my brush and just sort of um, blending those strokes out a little bit, fluffing them out with my brush. So you see, I only did a few at a time. That way I knew that the paint was still active by the time I get back there. My burnt umber going around some of these little cupped shapes. I want to do everything really harshly. I want to keep it kind of elegant and soft looking. And then taking a bit of water. And just washing out some of the edges if I feel that they're too harsh. Now I want to increase the contrast a little bit more. So I'm actually going to go to my Prussian blue and it works so beautifully with the burnt umber and the violet to create a really nice shadow tone. So this little triad of colors, my students always called crystal gray. <laughs> it's one of my favorite combinations. So if you're curious about making your own grays, definitely consult my um, video on making dynamic grays. You may find it really helpful and it's a much nicer range than just using black or brown or gray on its own all the time. This range has like a warmth and a coolness and that's what's going to make this a lot more natural. It's going to go into the violet which will help to cut some of the greenish quality that the Prussian's giving me. And I think I'll just blot to lift up some of the intensity of this. Back to the violet, but you'll know what you need here. And as I said, you can stop at phase two, or you can carry it this far. It's whatever is within your comfort zone. Just really playing with the pressure of my brush as well. Thick strokes, thin strokes. If you wanted to take this a step further, you could always add a little bit of shadow color using ultramarine blue right over top of a dry surface. That ultramarine blue just creates the illusion of a little bit of shading and you can temper that a bit with some violet. Keep it very transparent and very light. So the last thing I wanna show you is how to paint a pine tree 
using a fan brush. And this is my favorite way to paint pine trees. It's super efficient. The key is just making sure you've got a nice stiff synthetic bristle. So avoid using hog's hair bristles, which are very um, sturdy and rigid, but they don't stay splayed. This is my ivory fling. It's gonna stay nice and spiky, and that's really what you're gonna need for a tree like this. So I'm gonna start with my liner or a rigger. I'm gonna use my burnt umber and I'm just going to give myself a vertical line as a trunk, just as a base to start with, and then very quickly move into my hooker's green dark. I'm gonna test my strokes, see how much is on my brush, and it's kind of perfect right now. The key is to work quickly and work outward strokes and then you can apply more pressure and start brush, brushing uh, downward if you want to have those heavier branches. So outward and up. And notice I'm not using the brush completely vertical or perpendicular to my paper. I'm just using those last few kind of little fronds. Brushing outward. Now that looks like a bit like a pipe cleaner, so I want to add a little bit more depth to my brush strokes and build up the green so back to my hooker's green dark I want thick and thin I want a mix of sparse areas and really lush areas and I want variety finally I'm just going to end up with a little bit of violet that really helps to give that depth as you've been seeing. And I can just sort of tap that into the core. And if you've worked quickly, which is exactly what we're looking for here, that dark green paint that you put down initially is still gonna be active, so the new colors are gonna bleed perfectly. And it's really important to hide that initial line with paint. So you see, I started off with a base and then I'm just going back and kind of wrecking some of those lines that might seem too perfect. And I'm just using a couple little spikes on my fan brush here. And I'm gonna leave it at that. Now that this tree has had a chance to dry, you can always go back and add a little extra depth to its color by increasing the contrast. And once again, we can use that Hooker's Green Dark as a base and add some new color to it. So I like working on dry and coming back to it like this because I'll get really crispy results. So here's the violet. As we've learned, the violet and the hooker's green dark together make an incredible, beautiful um, dark green. If you want it looking a little bluer, just drop into your um, combination a little bit of the Prussian blue. If you wanted light coming from one side and just shadow on the other. Of course, you just paint these shadows on one side. You can simply blot on the highlight side. I think adding those extra shadow colors give a bit more of a realistic look to it and it certainly contributes to a more voluminous tree. Very, very simple combination of colors, very simple tools, and a very effective way to paint fairly realistic, but still playful looking um, winter greens. Thanks for watching everybody. I really hope you found this tutorial helpful. And if you did, please follow, share, subscribe, leave a comment, or you can even send me a super thanks, which would mean so much to me and would help me immensely in creating more content like this for you. Come follow me on social at Crystal Bashara Artist.